Hello and welcome to the second video in this low-level JavaScript series about building an asynchronous promise abstraction from scratch. If you haven't seen the first part, you might want to check that out, and you can find links for that on screen now and in the description. In this episode, we're going to build our own async functions using generators. To illustrate what an async function is and how it looks, let's re-implement the final example from the last video using async functions. We'll have an async function called do async stuff, in which we'll use the await keyword to get resolved values from promises. In an async function, instead of using catches to handle errors, we can actually just use try catch blocks and place the code that would have gone in a promise.catch into the catch exception handler. And async functions also simplify how finally works because we only need to place the code at the end of the async function after the try catch block so that it runs no matter what. Now that we're clear on what an async function looks like, let's take a look at how our generator based async functions might look. Obviously, we can't use the async or the await keyword since we're assuming through some apocalyptic disaster that we've lost those. The best thing we can do to replace the async keyword is just to use a function that I'll call async fn. That's going to take a promise generator function and return a function that takes a variable number of arguments. We'll come back in a bit and elaborate on exactly what this function will do. To convert do async stuff to use our implementation, we can replace the async keyword with a wrapped call to async fn, and the function inside will become a generator function. Lastly, we just need to replace the await keyword, which is specific to async functions, with the yield keyword, which is specific to generators. When our implementation is complete, the two implementations of do async stuff will actually be completely equivalent. So what exactly are the generator functions that this implementation hinges on? Well, in short, they're a kind of special JavaScript function that allow us to easily create coroutines. And of course, that just begs the question, what is a coroutine? To answer that question properly, we're going to need to build up an understanding with code. But in a nutshell, a coroutine is a piece of code that works together with another piece of code and it's able to be paused and resumed without starting the entire function from the beginning. To illustrate this, we're gonna have two pieces of code. One will be called the producer, and the other one will be called the interpreter. Right now, I'm just creating two specialized logging functions that will help us see output coming from each of those two different places. We'll start with the producer. This will be written with our generator function, and as the name implies, its job is to produce values. Just like any other function, a generator can take a number of arguments, which can be used inside the body of the function. Then we have the interpreter. The job of this function is to take the generator function and interpret the values that come out. The way in which a generator function produces values is either with the yield keyword or by returning a value, just like in a regular function. Let's add a few of these in. We'll have two yielded values and one returned value at the end. In order for the interpreter to get values from this generator function, it has to be called. When we call this function, we get a generator object, which we will call producer. To extract a value from the producer, we can call the dot next method, and then we can log out the value that we actually got. If we run this code in the terminal, we see that what actually comes out from a call to a producer.next is an object with a value key and a done key. The value is what was yielded from the generator, and the done tells us whether or not there are still more values to come from the generator. If we add two more calls to producer.next and log out their output, we see that we get all three different values from the generator. And with the last value, the one in which was returned, done is set to true, indicating that there were no more values to come from this generator. This becomes very clear if we add one more call to producer.next. Done is still true, and the value is simply undefined. 
we can rewrite the interpreter using a loop, which stops after the generator produces a done which is set to true. Something good to note here is that aside from the special yield keyword, generator functions actually work pretty much the same as regular functions. You can run whatever code you put in there, including loops, if statements, and early returns. It's very possible to have a generator function that never stops yielding values. We can think of the interpreter and the producer working together in the following way. The interpreter starts out in control of execution. It runs all the code up until it gets to producer.next. At this point, it essentially hands over execution control to the producer. The producer starts running all the code that it can up until it hits either a yield or a return. When it hits a yield, it sends the yielded value back and hands control of execution back to the interpreter. This cycle of taking turns to execute code and sending yielded values continues until there are no more values being produced. A really key point is that the lines where we're yielding values are actually expressions, meaning that we can assign their results to variables and log out their values. Looking at the logs, we can see that what happens is that the interpreter gets a value from the producer, and when next is called again, the yield expression turns into a value, except that the value is undefined. So is this a mistake? Well, it turns out that just like it's the producer's job to send values out of the generator and to the interpreter, it's also the interpreter's job to send values back into the producer that become the result of the yield expressions. That probably sounds confusing, but it's easier to see it in action. Let's keep track of the last value we got from the producer. It will initially be undefined, since we haven't gotten any values yet. At the end of the loop, we can reassign the last value to whatever the value was we actually got. Now, when we call producer.next, we'll pass the last value as an argument to the next method. And running this code in the terminal, we'll see that those yield expressions actually turned into the values that we provided to producer.next, which just so happened to be the same values that came out of the producer. This becomes obviously more powerful if we modify the values from the interpreter before sending them back in. Let's say we multiplied last value by 100 and ran the code again. Now we see that both A and B are 100 times bigger. And this is really why generators allow us to write coroutines. These two pieces of code cooperate in order to achieve a common task. They take turns executing and exchanging results. The beauty of this system is that both pieces of code are absolutely independent and their behavior becomes more than the sum of its parts because each one can compute based on what the other one gave it. Now that we understand what generators are and how they work, the question becomes, how do we use this language feature to create our own asynchronous functions? It might be clear by this point that the yield keyword is going to act as our await keyword. So we will be yielding promises from the generator function, our producer, and we'll have an interpreter that will have to take those promises and wait for them to resolve or reject. When they have, the value or the rejection reason will be passed back into the generator so that the execution can continue. Let's make this concrete and revisit the skeleton async fn function that we wrote earlier. Async fn is a curried function where the promise generator function comes first and then the variable number of arguments come later. When it's finally called, we can create a producer from the promise generator function, passing along any arguments that we received. It's important that we create a fresh generator object every time because generator objects themselves are very stateful and a user should be able to call the same async function many times. I'm going to create an interpreter function inside this one, and the result of the entire async fn will be the result of calling interpreter. The reason that we actually need a second function is because we're gonna be calling it recursively, so we need that name to reference to. 
The first thing that we're going to want to do is to get a produced value and whether or not we're done out of the producer. Notice that the interpreter receives the last value as an argument. We're going to pass that along to producer.next. Now in the first call, the one from async.fn, the last value will just be undefined. But when we recursively call interpreter in a moment, we'll use an actual value. Once we have a produced output, we can check if the generator is done. If it's not done, then we can check to see if the value that we got was a promise or not with the isThenable function. If it is, then we can actually just return value.then, which creates a new promise where we take the resolved value and we make a recursive call to interpreter with the resolved value. Since the interpreter is always using the same producer, when producer.next is called again, the generator function will pick up where it left off and we will have passed in the resolved value. But we also need to handle possible rejections. So we can add a catch callback to the then as well, where we call the interpreter recursively with the rejected value. Now, this isn't really correct, since a rejection inside an async function would actually need to throw an error, but we'll come back in a moment and fix this. Now, you may or may not know this, but async functions are actually pretty relaxed about what you can await. You can actually just await regular values. And we will also have to be relaxed in our implementation as well. For that, we can add an else to the isThenable check and then return a recursive call to interpreter with this value. And lastly, if we're done, we still need to check if the value is a promise or not. But this time we mainly care if it's not because the interpreter always needs to return a promise in exactly the same way that an async function always needs to return a promise. So if it's not a thenable, we should wrap up the value in a LLJS promise.resolve. Otherwise, we can just return the promise itself, which is value. Let's test this out. I'll fix the broken file name in our do async stuff function and finish this file off with a call to do async stuff. Checking the output in the terminal, it seems to be working exactly as expected. First, the file was read, then it waited a second and printed the first 200 characters of the file with all the vowels removed and it logged the general message at the end from what used to be our finally code. But if we break the file name again, you'll notice a weird result. Instead of entering the catch block when the error occurred, execution actually just continued as normal, and it ended up breaking by trying to call dot replace on the error object. In order to fix this, we need to learn about one more cool feature of generators. Just like we can call generator.next with a value on our producer, we can also call the generator.throw method. It works almost the same because it allows us to send a value back into the generator and hand over control, only now the value that we pass in is actually an error and we're actually throwing it. Which means that if we happen to do this while the generator function is executing code in a try catch block, it will trigger the catch rejection handler because an error really has been thrown. But how do we know whether we should call next or throw inside async fn? Well, a very simple way is to just add a second argument to the interpret function called was error. If was error is true, we'll use the dot throw method and otherwise we'll use dot next. By default, it's going to be falsy because we won't give it any value but we can set it directly to true in the rejection handler of our then. Let's give this another try in the terminal. We'll see that this no longer tries to call replace and actually it just shows the expected error messages and then the all done message at the end. And so with that, we've actually created our own async functions from scratch on top of our own custom promise implementation. I hope that this has given you a new appreciation and a new insight on how async abstractions come to be. And I hope that it's also given you a new lens on generator functions. These can be used to create so many core cool APIs and they are really underutilized in the JavaScript space. All the code from today is available on GitHub. So you can use that as a basis to expand on or just follow along.
Thanks to all the patrons whose support massively helps this channel. If you'd like to become a patron, visit patreon.com forward slash low level JavaScript to get access to scripts, Q and A's and give feedback on videos before they're released. You'll find links in the description that go deeper into all the concepts that we've looked at today. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.